today on Oz. Could you have a heart attack and not know it? The silent heart attack. I thought I had the flu or pneumonia. The subtle signs you shouldn't ignore. I thought I was going to die. Plus, one day he had 20-20 vision. The next, he was blind. Now, I've got a surprise for you. The moment he sees his kids for the first time. Coming up next on Dr. Oz. Could you have a heart attack and not know it? Almost one third of heart attacks have symptoms that go unrecognized by you and oftentimes your doctor. It's called a silent heart attack. How could this even happen? Let me, let me show you what's going on. So the heart is kept alive by these big blood vessels, right? They're called the coronary arteries and they bring life, nourish, sustaining oxygen and blood to the different tissues of the heart. But over time, if we're having a blockage, for example, right here, you can see it getting narrower and narrower, you close off that blood vessel so that oxygen and blood can't get to the tissue. So what happens? Well, normally, if you're having a heart attack, which is what this is, you get a little bruise here, and the body wants to tell you that. So you get pain. You get pain in the chest, like an elephant sitting on you. It goes up to your neck, even out to your left shoulder. You go to the hospital, you unblock the artery, get your life saved. But what if the pain goes away? It's not there. It's a silent heart attack, and you literally walk away, completely unaware that your heart is suffering and struggling. You're able to keep functioning, and so you continue your day without knowing that you just had a heart attack. Now, if 30% of heart attacks are silent, then you may feel subtle things. But unless you know what to look for, you'll never think that it's your heart. I want you to meet Sherry. She's a classic example of a silent heart attack. I was 41 years old and would have never imagined I'd be having a heart attack. I knew all the classic symptoms, even for women, but I never had one of those. I remember for a couple of weeks, I wasn't feeling well. I was feeling rather run down. It was winter, so I thought I had the flu or pneumonia. But finally, I had to call my doctor because I realized things were progressively getting worse. They did my blood pressure. They ran tests. They took chest x-rays. They treated me for the common chest cold. But I continued to get worse and worse. Finally, my doctor ran a test, and we got an answer. I had suffered a silent heart attack. By the time I got to the hospital, we had discovered I had 100% blockage. Sherry's joining us. So what was it like to, to hear those words, silent heart attack? You realize you'd had damage to your heart, but hadn't been aware of it. I was very frightened. I thought I was going to die. It was disturbing, because I have small children and a family to take care of. You didn't have any of the classic signs? You didn't have the chest pain, the pain in your jaw, or anything like that? None of the classic signs. I didn't have any of that. I didn't have any of the cold sweats, no chest pain, no shortness of breath. It was very disturbing because I knew all the classic signs. I have a background in occupational therapy assisting where we study pathophysiological -physi conditions, right. and I had training in CPR. So if someone like you doesn't know it, then I suspect a lot of people won't know these. And listen, the classic signs of a heart attack are actually a blessing in disguise. I want you to think about that, a blessing in disguise. Why? Because you know you're having a problem, right? Imagine if you put your foot in the fire and you didn't feel pain. You would never be able to move it out. So when I show that avatar walking off this little cartoon that I made, having had a heart attack, think about yourself in that situation. So you may, after a heart attack, feel subtle signs, things that you wouldn't think of, fatigue, dizziness, lightheadedness, flu-like symptoms, things you wouldn't normally associate with a heart attack. And Sherry, you had those signs. I did indeed. Um, I, it was just after the holidays, so I was a little bit run down. Um, I did think I had the flu and possibly the pneumonia. When I called my doctor, I was thinking I had pneumonia. Yeah. And then I progressively got worse, which led me to going to the hospital. However, if I realized it was a heart attack, I would have called 911 and went by ambulance, but I physically walked into the emergency room. And if you'd gone urgently to a hospital, we could have opened that blood vessel, maybe Absolutely. preventing some of that damage that I showed earlier. And this is the thing, the symptoms are very minor, but they will gradually worsen. And hear me on this, this is important. Remember I showed a little part of the heart that was bruised, like yes. somebody punched it when the blood vessel closed off? Now imagine this happening. You're having a silent heart attack, and then you have a little bruise that I showed you right there, right? And then you don't respond to it, you don't know what it is, you think it's pneumonia in your case, Sherry, so you have another bruise that's formed when another blood vessel closes off. And then you get a third bruise because you didn't act on the first two bruises. So the same pop problem that causes the first bruise doesn't go away. It gets worse and worse and worse and continues to get medical care or until the whole heart's dead. And I can tell you, the first heart, mechanical heart operation I ever did was on a woman who had solid heart attacks. 
perfectly smart lady who never knew her heart was dying until it was too late. Wow. So I know we can do better. That's why I'm so passionate about this topic. Sherry, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. There's one key risk factor that could be making you more susceptible to a silent heart attack than any other. And I brought in preventive cardiologist, a physician who works at my hospital. Welcome. Hi, how are you? Uh, Dr. Sonia Talani to help explain this. So we just met Sherry, who's had a silent heart attack without the classic heart attack signs. Again, something that is sort of stunning. How common is this story in your own practice? And how do folks mostly find out that they've had a silent heart attack? Well, it's actually a lot more common than you think. And it, sometimes people really feel nothing and we just pick it up on an EKG. But more often than not, it's like Sherry. People feel unwell. They just don't know what it is. And it's very easy to get misdiagnosed that way, especially as a woman, because even though we know that heart disease is the number one killer of women, often when a woman goes to her doctor's office, to the emergency room, heart disease is not the number one thing that a doctor's thinking of. This pneumonia diagnosis Sherry brought up, it's you know, probably more thoughtfully co coming up in conversation than the heart attack, which probably should have been brought up. So Absolutely. let's go over these risk factors for heart attack, the things that we know we should be taking care of, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, of course being overweight, we talk a lot about that, a family history, and smoking. Turns out these risk factors are the same for a silent heart attack. But Dr. Talani, you raise concern about a risk factor that actually is much more prominently found in people having silent heart attacks. Absolutely, and that's diabetes. Because in, in diabetes, you have poor circulation and you have high blood sugar, and that actually damages the nerves. So diabetics don't feel the same things that you and I feel. So they can put their foot in a fire, or stub their toe and not feel it. And in the same way, they can have a heart attack and not have symptoms. Let's go through this if you don't mind. What are the subtle signs that tip you off as a cardiologist that someone might be having a silent, what we call a silent heart attack? Well, we mentioned a couple things, feeling fatigued or unwell. But what can happen, and as you showed on your uh, diagram, is that as the heart muscle, this vital muscle, gets deprived of oxygen, more and more damage can occur. And it's a pump. And when that damage happens, the pump doesn't work as efficiently, and you can get a backup of fluid. You might notice that with swelling in your legs, feeling that your pants are too tight, bloating, having difficulty breathing. Some people find that they need to use more and more pillows to sit up to breathe at night. And whereas a week ago, they could jump up a, a flight of stairs, no problem, each step is a struggle now. But more often than not, people in hindsight can pinpoint that moment where maybe it was a bout of really bad indigestion or a shoulder sprain, and that's actually when their event was. That was their heart attack. Sherry, in hindsight, does, it, does any of this resonate for you? Was there a moment that you think maybe you actually had that silent heart attack? Yes, I did. Uh, about a day or two before the new year had changed over, um, I woke up out of my sleep with a severe indigestion feeling, and also I thought maybe I pulled something because I coughed really hard because I'm known for doing that when I cough. Right. And I ignored it and went back to sleep. But that could have possibly been the first sign of my heart attack happening. You ignored it. I ignored it. And I'm women, lucky I woke up. women do this all the time, all the time. Ignore important signs that you're all feeling because. There's no time for that kind of exactly. stuff. Exactly. We're too busy taking care of everybody else. That's right. what my case was. I was a caregiver to family, and I don't, I don't look at myself and say, hey. Yeah, let's stop that today, everybody. Let's stop that today. Studies suggest that these silent heart attacks are more common in women. Is it because is it they're denying that it's real, or are there other physiologic reasons that the female body is different? Well, that's part of it, and we don't absolutely know why, but women tend to have more what we call atypical symptoms. So rather than having classic chest pain, they may feel nausea, vomiting, stomach aches, dizziness. And that's why it's so important for women like Sherry to listen to their bodies, because generally we do spend all this time taking care of everyone else, but we know when there's something wrong. And you have to really, as, especially as a woman, listen to your body and take that time to put yourself first. And if something's wrong and you feel it, to go see your doctor, because silent heart attacks are just as deadly as a regular heart attack. And the longer you go without knowing that you've had one, the worse your outcome's gonna be. So listen to your body and get that help. Let's be clear about this. They are called silent heart attacks, but that's actually not really the right word. They're more like whispering heart attacks. And if you know what to look for, what these whispers are, you'll act on them. And please take charge of that. There's a great brand new article on DrOz.com on how to detect a silent heart attack. I want all of you to check it out if you can. If it's happening to you, raise the white flag. We'll be right back. Coming up next.
Blind for 10 years, unable to see his own wedding or the birth of his two children, he thought his vision was gone forever. But can a new technology give him back the sight he lost? The surprise he doesn't see coming. That's next. Dr. Raz and Dr. Sanjay Gupta clear up confusion on the latest superbug killing people in California, the measles outbreak, new dietary guidelines, and more. All new odds. That's coming up tomorrow. Most of us see the joys and sorrows of everyday life like this, crystal clear. But imagine if in a matter of days, your eyesight starts to fail. That's what happened to Warren Reyna. He missed seeing his own wedding. He missed the birth of his two children. And there's smiles every single day when he comes home. But today, new technology may be able to give him all of this and his sight back. Warren was a normal, happy child. He rode horses, hunted rabbits, played baseball. In his 20s, he had a great girlfriend a great job working in the oil fields of Texas and made great money. Warren had perfect 2020 vision. All in all, he was enjoying life. But I'll never forget the day when everything changed. Warren was 23 and driving with his wife's cousin to a job interview. And somehow I completely did not see an oncoming truck. Warren just barely avoided hitting it. And my wife's cousin yelled at me, Hey, didn't you see that? And I hadn't. That was when Warren first realized the vision in his right eye was blurry. At first, I thought I just might need eyeglasses. So Warren went to the eye doctor, who tried every lens, but he still couldn't read the chart. So he followed up with a CAT scan, an MRI, even a spinal tap. After a week in the hospital, a specialist came in and broke the news to me. I had a rare genetic eye disorder, and I was going to go legally blind quickly. Sure enough, the condition moved over to his left eye, and within days, Warren was indeed legally blind. Warren and his wife, Samantha, are both here. So, Warren, you've been legally blind for about 10 years now. You've missed lots of moments, ones we've sort of th talked through. How difficult has that been? It's been heartbreaking especially with my kids. I wasn't able to see them when they were born. I would have, I loved being there, but I would have loved to see their faces, see if they had my nose, my <laughs> smile, my eyes. Samantha but, probably describes that for you a little bit, <laughs> I would hope. Oh yeah, yes, yeah, I do. And it's hard because there's times where people say, oh, he looks just like you. And he's like, do they? <laughs> they do. <laughs> do they? <laughs> so wh when the doctors told you that you're gonna lose your eyesight. It's happened so quickly. How did you prepare yourself for the blindness you knew would come? There's actually no way to prepare for something like that, but luckily I have good memory and I remember where a lot of things are, but it's still been pretty tough. Is there any hope of getting your eyesight back at all? Well, I'll never have 20-20 vision again, but with some new technology, some glasses called eSight, I still have the blur, mm -hmm but I can now see the, the outside of it still uh, detail mm. and hopefully see the faces of my kids. That would be nice. Yeah. Can I show everybody what these glasses are like, okay? Sure. I'm passionate about this. This new technology won't just change Warren's sight, but these types of approaches to problems with sight could be huge for us. So think about this. Our eye processes information, right? And it does it with a nerve in the back of the eye. That's the optic nerve back there. In Warren's case, damage, so the light comes through the lens here, damage to the back of the eye, and that nerve blocks out certain parts, and the nerve starts to die. This causes him to have central vision loss. You see the periphery out here? That gets dull too, by the way, but it's there. Now, these glasses, you put them on. Now, what are glasses? They're electronic tools to make videos of what you're looking at. It can help you zoom in on the image, enhance the image. So what it does is it fills in the details behind the blind spot, helps you fill in from what's behind there, and gives the brain much more rich information they would normally miss. So you can sort of move over and see what you otherwise couldn't see. Now, think about this. This innovative technology helps people who are legally blind. So we can take the ability of a camera and a glass to help our brain cope with what otherwise would have caused blindness. So I like this a lot as a big idea that could change the way so many Americans live their lives. So Samantha, 
it's, they're great glasses, only one problem. These kinds of technologies are pretty expensive. Very expensive. They're about 15000 And we are doing fundraisers right now, barbecue, because he loves barbecuing. I mean, he does? you get him next to a barbecue pit and he'll act like there's nothing wrong with him. How you, are you, how are your ribs? Are your ribs good? Yes. His ribs are awesome. <laughs> coming from Texas, we have the best barbecue. <laughs> I knew it was coming. <laughs> they're, they're booing out there. Every state's got the best barbecue. Yeah. So. <laughs> so what would it mean for the two of you, Samantha, if this somehow you mean, could get there? This would mean the world to us because, I mean, my daughter's growing up. She's starting to participate in sports. And, I mean, he's physically there. It's just, you know, it's hard because I have to tell him. You know, she hit a ball, or she did this, or she did that, and he can't see that. And how's the fundraising going? It's doing pretty good. We've raised about 3000 I mean, I know we still have a lot more to go, but we're trying. It's slowly but surely, it's a process. And, you know, just take it one day at a time. So I actually asked someone, Yvonne Felix, she's an Eastside spokesperson to be here. She's also legally blind. Um, she has the glasses on, and you, you wear them, I guess you adjust them just to, to make sure you can see better, but how are they working for you, and what's it like to be able to use them after having been legally blind? My experience is very much like Warren's. The first time I put them on, I had my two-month-old son, and I have a six-year-old, and, you know, I was married, I had my kids, I had no idea what anyone looked like, and I was in my home, and I put them on, and I saw my husband holding my son, and I saw him, I saw them for the first time. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable is the right word. I gotta say, as a, as a father, and I'm a grandfather now, I can't imagine living my life without the ability to, to see the beauty in their faces. And it's not just the pictures, it's sensing the emotion of it when you look at people. So I've got a surprise for you. The wonderful folks at Eastside Glasses, they want you to see and they want you to take this home with you. It's a lot of barbecue. Don't put it on, let's try it on. No. Now I know you have to adjust them a little bit. And I've been promised barbecue from Texas for this, by the way. <laughs> Which is, by the way, plenty of recompense for what I'm... Uh, can you see okay? Yes, sir. I'm just trying to adjust the contrast. Now, you're going to be able to see for the first time, if I am get this right. Correct. Does it work that quickly? Yes, sir. I can see you. You can see me? <laughs> yes, sir. Can you, can you see Samantha? Yes, sir. I can. You know, yes, I can see her. What do you think about I this? see some adjustments. Uh, uh, <clears throat> sorry. I... Uh, I think it's pretty awesome. I, uh, <laughs> I can't wait to see my kids. You know what? Bring the kids out. Bring them out. I know you want to see them. They want to see you. Come on out, little ones. Oh, look how cute they are. <laughs> Join them. Come sit down. Sit down here. Okay. Take a second. I got to say, this is what we ought to be doing anyway. We don't look into our kids' faces enough. But go ahead and enjoy them. What's it like to look see them? Hey, baby girl. <laughs> like your daddy. This is the one they look looks just like you, they say. <laughs> I do think he looks like you. Yeah, I do. I can see. Uh, I'd like to. I don't know who cut his hair, but I think I'm going to talk with him. <laughs> <laughs> Going to cut his hair differently. Yeah, especially the bangs, I think. Uh, yeah, it's, it's. I'm kidding. Uh, it's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of overwhelming, actually. <clears throat> you, don't, you don't have to say anything. Samantha? <clears throat> Thank you so much. This is so awesome. I mean, uh, just for him to be able to see them, this is, I mean, this is a dream that he's been, I mean, it's, I can't even put it in words. <laughs> well, you don't have to. You don't have to thank me either. I want to thank the wonderful folks at Eastside who gave you this wonderful gift. Enjoy it. Keep making the barbecue. Enjoy the wonderful kids. I'm very excited for all of you, Warren. Thank we'll be right back. Do you suffer from swelling, bruising, or chronic pain? You may find relief in this much-loved tropical fruit, considered to be the number one holistic healer for pain. Find out how this secret ingredient can help alleviate your discomfort naturally next. If you're 
looking to alleviate bruising, swelling, or overall hurting, the solution may be in this pineapple. Inside this fruit is an enzyme, it's called bromelain, and it's been touted as a number one holistic healer for your pain. Originating in South America, the pineapple has been used for centuries to help digestion and treat inflammation. Today, we know it's the protein enzyme bromelain, concentrated in the pineapple stem that gives this sweet fruit its healing properties. Because bromelain also reduces swelling, it can help soothe minor burns and relax muscles. In a study of 146 boxers, over 70% of those who use bromelain reported all signs of bruising to be gone in four days, as opposed to only 14% of those who use the placebo. You can tap into this powerful enzyme's pain-fighting properties by taking it as a supplement or the tried and true way by packing pineapple into your daily diet. Dina Lodutache is a naturopath who uses bromelain to treat her patients. So why is bromelain your go-to for pain? I really do love it, Dr. Oz, because there are a lot of studies coming out showing how effective bromelain is as a pain reliever and an anti-inflammatory um, in, in comparison to the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, but it doesn't have the side effects on your stomach and in your nervous system. Another reason is that it's actually very quickly absorbed into the body. Within an hour of taking it, you get the highest concentrations of bromelain. And then lastly, what, what I always love is that it comes in a food form, a vitamin, a supplement, a tablet, so it's really quite versatile. So let's get to how you're gonna use bromelain to treat different injuries. We're gonna start off with a very common problem, bruising and swelling. What is the best way to use bromelain for this? So what I always recommend for my patients is to always actually keep bromelain in their medicine cabinet because you don't know when you're going to need it. Um, there was actually a study done of 160 women who had post-surgical bruising and swelling, and the study showed that 90% of the women had amazing effects on using bromelain in comparison to only 44% of the placebo. It's wonderful. Let me show you, if I, if I can, why we think bromelain might be so effective. Mm -hmm. There's a little animation I made showing you sort of running, which you should all be doing. So as you're running along here and minding your own business, Every once in a while, you make a little misstep. When you make that misstep, ooh, watch that. You kink your ankle, you sprain your ankle. Immediately, a signal goes out to let the blood vessels get larger, and they begin to seep out fluid. It actually becomes a way of immobilizing the ankle. In the old days, it was probably helpful, but that fluid causes irritation and inflammation, all that redness, the swelling. So what bromelain we think to, does is it reduces the amount of fluid that leaks out, the toxic fluid that sometimes causes inflammation, allows the blood vessels to shrink back down, gives your body a chance to remove the fluid, remove the swelling, and get back to normal more rapidly. So Pina, if you can get this benefit, ideally you have to take the right dose to achieve it. Absolutely, so what I usually recommend is about 500 milligrams three times a day. If you're finding that it's not going down in a couple of days, I do tell patients to increase it to 1,000 milligrams three times a day. You know, what, what I do tell patients, of course, if you're on antibiotics or a blood thinner or blood pressure medication, please consult your physician first. Um, but definitely you could ramp up on the dose and come back down as the bruising comes back down. So in a few days you're hopefully off it. Absolutely. Right, let's turn to the issue of burns, which is a, a problem that we've experienced in the kitchen, all kinds of things bring it on. So what happens if you got a burn in your skin? What, which is the way of applying bromelain? So what I also love, so bromelain comes in a cream. And so with bromelain coming in a cream, what, what it does is actually when you have a burn, it could have help your body remove the residual damaged tissue from the burn. So if you come into my practice, what I would do is exactly, I'm gonna actually demo on oh, you. Oh, you gonna demo it? Oh yeah. I got a demo today. Yeah, you know, you know, well, not a manicure, but you know, we will try this. <laughs> and so what I tell patients when they come into my practice, I will put the cream on and what it does, it actually helps with pain, with the inflammation. And not only that, it actually can prevent scar tissue. So, and then we'll cover that up. So you left a fur amount on there, which is nice. You're not rubbing it in, you're just no, coating just, it. No, just coating it, nice and gentle, because it's a burn, and so you want to be very careful. And you do it until the burn heals. Absolutely. All right, finally, bromelain can help with joint pain. Quashina is joining us. She suffers from joint pain. Where, you don't look like you're in pain. <laughs> How are, you? <laughs> how, are you, how are your joints treating you today? Uh, they're actually doing pretty good. I'm a little high up today, so. So what's hurting you? Well, actually, it's my shin. So what happens is, like, after I work, I work a lot, and by the time I get home, yeah. I take off my shoes. And I have this throbbing sensation in my, my shins. Yeah. And so if I feel it coming on, especially when it's cold, I'll take a couple of over-the-counter medicine before mm -hmm. I go lay down. Otherwise, I'll be up all night. It's either that or wine, which, whichever. No. <laughs> we had a better solution than both of them. So, Peter, how can we help out here? 
What would you recommend for although joint wine pains? and pineapple might taste good. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, actually, what I do recommend instead, is, which is one of my favorite, is food as medicine. So I recommend having a half a cup of pineapple a day because what it does, if you're having a chronic issue, it's a way to get the bromelain into your body. And not only are you getting the anti-inflammatory aspects of the bromelain in the pineapple, you're also going to get some vitamin C, which increases collagen, which makes your joints stronger. So the bromelain's actually in the pineapple? That's correct. It's, That's where it comes from. It's in this middle part. Of right, the it's in the stem. Okay. And for people who have chronic problems, you know, these were acute problems over here. You sprained your ankle, got a little burn. If you're having aches and pains because you're going to go to work every day probably or right. a lot of days, you want to use it as a food. Don't get it in pill so or cream form. do I have to eat it like whole or well, can I drink it like, you know, No, what I do, juice? I She wants to go back to the wine again. Put I, it in your wine. <laughs> make a sangria. Oh, it's so good. I, okay, that works for me. I don't have any issues with that. <laughs> right, because then you fall asleep and you won't feel exactly. anything. Right. Okay. So, but no, it, I do recommend trying to get it through the food because it does have the other components of the vitamin C as well as the bromelain. Okay. So I always recommended the whole food sourcing of it. Right. You know, and it's wonderful because again, the studies show that in comparison of people taking bromelain in comparison to standard medication, the people who took the bromelain did do better. So is that daily? Yes, if it you is take daily. it daily. It's a gift from so, the show. Thank oh, you well, very much. Did a nice does job. Does this turn into wine? Yes, it does. <laughs> we'll be right back. What's your favorite way to naturally quell pain? I've had back pain for a few years, but I hate taking acetaminophen or aspirin. I started stretching in the morning and at night, and it really does the trick. Best of all, it's completely natural. It changed my life. Share yours on Facebook.com slash Dr. Oz. Next, Dr. Oz celebrates his granddaughter's first birthday. Daughter Daphne comes to the party and reveals all. From Philomena's biggest milestones to the biggest challenge of motherhood, join in on all the fun for Philo's birthday celebration, coming up. Dr. Oz and Dr. Sanjay Gupta clear up confusion on the latest superbug killing people in California, the measles outbreak, new dietary guidelines, and more. All new Oz. That's coming up tomorrow. introduce you to the person who has taught me the most this past year. She's someone who leads by example, embracing failure and learning from mistakes. Today she's here to show us how small steps can turn into great strides. So who's the expert? My granddaughter, Philomena. Because today is Philo's first birthday. Come on out, Philo, and my daughter, Daphne. <laughs> oh, I'm These so are best friends right here. Yes. So I'm so happy you're here with me today. I miss you. Any excuse to spend time with you. What's that? And this is a peanut butter and jelly cake, Philo. PB and J are her initials, by the way. Right. You want to have some? Oh. She'll think about it a little bit. She's very interested in all of you out she, there. Well, look, it's a beautiful audience. She's like, ooh, I like So it. what's been the most rewarding part? Oh, she looks at the lights. <laughs> what's been the most rewarding part of all this for you? Oh. Well, well, I love cake. seeing you two together. That for me has been amazing. Oh, oh. And, and mommy too. The grand. <laughs> this is what she's supposed to. It's her birthday. Get in there. Get that <laughs> teddy bear. Pick it up. It's all yours. Oh. Oh, jeez. Well, that's not good. Doctor Oz. <laughs> you're trying yeah. to <laughs> get that out of the way. It's supposed Here. to be a safe zone. Um, <laughs> but I also found that you, know, you, you kind of think you know what love is, and then you have a child, and it's like a whole new heart happens. Don't you guys feel that way? I, and I, I imagine every child must feel like that, where you, you, you just have a whole new second set of love all for them. And that has been amazing. And, and what's you, the big challenge with her? Mm, mm, that she's so delicious. See, I'm, mm. I'm prepared. I'm the fastest diaper changer out there. So I've got <laughs> rags all everywhere. The biggest challenge, um, well, it's not really her. I think it's with me. I think you kind of have to relearn how to be yourself after you have a baby because you're a different person and, and you're a better version of yourself for sure. Yeah, I didn't tell you this before. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to learn how to be confident again. You have to learn how to make time for the things that matter for you besides your family. And of course, making plenty of time for her and not feeling guilty when you take time for yourself. I think women are so quick to give everything they have to everyone else as, as is wonderful. But, uh, but you need to make sure it's your life too and that you're doing the things that make you feel good and strong and powerful. And you're just <laughs> oh, taking over. She's taking over. She's getting comfortable her own talk show. Oh, the shoes are off. The shoes are off. And how's it changed having her grow from the, I remember when she first came out, she was like a little bird. Yes. <laughs> 
Yes, I'm listening. <laughs> and now, of course, it's a very different experience. Yeah. No, you know, I, I think... Um, I think those first couple months are just terrifying all the time because you're so nervous, you're doing everything wrong, and you're you're scared they're gonna die every night when you're not. You know? um, but then I think that three month mark was the one that really transitioned for me because all of a sudden she starts to recognize you and the giggling and they and they're just loving you back and there's so much recognition there. And then from there on out, it's just one month after the next, everything's changing. It's laughing, it's giggling, it's it's clapping, it's crawling. You, she's the fastest crawler in the north. She, oh, you lost a shoe already, girl. She, she lost that when you walked out here. Uh, <laughs> grab her up here, because I wasn't being purely facetious when I talked about how much she's taught us. Come on, my, my beautiful one, I love you so much. All right, to celebrate what Philo has taught me, I got her I a couple gifts. I love you bring her here and she doesn't get to eat any cake. This is like the most Dr. Well, Oz birthday. Because I found ever. out it has peanut butter in it. She hasn't had peanut butter yet, so I can't give her the cake. But she got the little chocolate stuff there. Okay, gift number one. Are you ready, Philo, for all the gifts? Okay, gift number one is in here, and it is what? all about your ability to embrace challenges Here's some knee pads for you, oh Philo. They're perfectly, they're color, oh. it's just your color. When we crawl the stairs, as daunting it is, she'll look up, imagine looking up 20 steps, and she has no hesitation at all, which I think what we all need to do as adults is to embrace the opportunity to fail and give it everything you've got. That's her first gift. Her second gift is all about smiling. How many of you guys smile as much as you should? A lot of us, hands up, maybe. <laughs> The second gift is all about smiling, making you feel better. <laughs> what do you think? <gasps> she likes looking. Oh. 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 Well, she's been forced to take quite a few selfies, so she probably knows what that looks like. <laughs> you like that picture? You, know, you can all do this. Look in a mirror as you walk by and force yourself to smile at it. It actually does wonders. And it's crazy, it's as simple as it seems, it works for adults as well as children. But the big gift is here. A little secret for you all, Philo has not walked yet. Part of the reason she hasn't walked is because why would you bother walking and people are carrying you all the time? <laughs> so we're gonna give her an opportunity. Here she is walking with her father this weekend. Ooh, it's... Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the war cry. So Philo, I got you this. Do you want some help? No, there you are, honey. Oh, but, what? Now, it's, a, it's an extra saucer, which I know she'll like. Oh, she wants that in a big way. Oh. But you, ah, yeah, you, toys, ah, toys. Toys? You think she could walk on set? What do you think? Well, she lost her shoe. I don't want her to slip, so I'll hold her. I'll hold her. Okay, I'll hold her. I'll hold her. Okay. Are you ready, honey? Let's see you walk. Let me see you walk. Oh, no. No, no way. All right. She's like, I'm there she here. goes. I'm out of here. I'm out of here. She, uh, she wants to get in here. This now you're gonna see someone go fast here. Put her in here. Now Daphne, as I put her in her extra saucer. There we go. Uh, I want to say something to you. Yes. Go. She goes. She, she, she wander. She'll be all over the set now. Goodbye. See you later. A lot of times you don't celebrate moms. It was Daphne's birthday last week. So I have a little birthday present from you. I got one of your favorite people, Chocolatier Jacques Torres. Here's a little present for you. Why play the video, please. I hope you're going to enjoy my cake. And also I hope that we're going to do more and more chocolate together. Happy birthday. I love him. Thank you, Jacques. That, he is and the sweetest. This is for you, honey. Happy birthday wow. to you oh and all goodness. the moms out there who get forgotten I all the time. I gotta share this. Oh my goodness. I, I if I give this to Philo, she's gonna write I'll eat it this. right there. That's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. You know so what? Much. Everything that you said that your daughter did, you did for me. It's been a treasure to have you in my life from the moment you came to us. And I love you very much. I love you too. Right? Thanks. So, as a gift, I made a little photo montage. You can all check it out on drraz.com. Oh. This is me at the very beginning with my daughter, Daphne. We'll be right back. <laughs> Is your blood sugar skyrocketing? Do you even know what your levels are? It's the number Dr. Oz wants everyone to know and to have tested. You could have diabetes or pre-diabetes. Find out the surprising warning signs that can help tip you off next. We are bringing healthy back this season. I want you to bring it too. Grab your prescription pad for fun and sign up for free tickets today. You can go to DrOz.com slash tickets and sign up. Did I get it right? <laughs> Today I'm revealing surprising warning signs that your blood sugar may be too high. Now here to help me walk through these is Rosa from our audience. Do you know your fasting blood sugar? Yeah, give her a hand. Fasting blood sugar. Do you think you might know that number? I have no idea, Dr. Oz. No idea? No idea. 
but you're not alone. I actually polled the entire audience here today. 94% of the people polled said, like you, I have no idea what my blood sugar is when I'm fasting. That's a big deal, guys, because your critical number of blood sugar can tell you a ton of things, including whether you have diabetes or pre-diabetes, which has lots to do with this segment because 30% of people in America who have diabetes, a very deadly but very preventable and treatable problem, don't know they have it. Wow. So we're gonna change that today. So let's get that off. So I'm gonna tip you off with some little ideas that might tell you if your blood sugar is a little too high. Okay. The first surprising sign is unusual thirst. Let me explain why this unusual thirst is such an important sign. So your body, represented by these boxes, is made up of water. You need to have water in your body. And you have sugar, right? They have nutrition. You need to use the sugar to do things in your body. And now in your bloodstream, if your sugar goes up too high, let's say this is your sugar. Go ahead and pour that in in the sugar, sugar container. Now, instead of being balanced out, water with sugar, because they love each other, they're like a couple, right? They might fight once in a while, but they really do want to be together. When you have too much sugar in your body, as I've demonstrated here, it creates an imbalance. So your body says, I got to fix that problem. Okay. So how would you fix this problem? Get rid of the sugar. Yeah, right? try to cut down. Cut down. So what does the body do? The body has the ability to urinate it out. So it will literally begin to urinate out the urine, but unfortunately, the water doesn't want to leave its friend. It comes along for the ride. Literally, wow. the sugar with the water together drain out into your urine, which is why you're always going to the bathroom, but you're always thirsty too, because no matter how much you try to drink water, because there's too much sugar, the body's peeing the sugar out, dragging its friend the water with it, and you're never up to balance again. That explains a lot. The other thing is people have to go to the bathroom a lot. I just showed you why, right? You gotta pee out the extra sugar, so all night long you're going to the bathroom. So if you gotta get up more than once a night to go to the bathroom, in the back of your mind you gotta be thinking maybe I got a little diabetes going on. Okay, so that's the first big tip. The second surprising sign that your blood sugar is actually higher than you want it to be are frequent yeast infections. So this is a delicate question, but since you were kind enough to join me up on the stage without asking any questions about what I was gonna do with you, let me ask you, are yeast infections a problem for you? you know I can't remember, um, must have been years ago. Right. That's very actually, rare. I'm very happy about that. Mm -hmm. People with yeast infections, remember three out of four women have yeast infections in a lifetime, so what you just described is the norm. Mm -hmm. But when you have a high blood sugar, it sets up an ideal culture medium for these bacteria. They love the extra sugar. And when they have imbalance like that, you'll get three, four yeast infections a year. And that's what often is found in people who have diabetes. So people having frequent yeast infections, everyone at home, pay attention to that. That's what I want you to, to, to notice because that's the tip off that your sugar's not where it needs to be. Okay. So far you're doing pretty well. Thank, Thank you, you very much Thank for Thank you, Dr. All right. Now there's a third thing I want you to pay attention to because diabetes can affect every part of the body and often that leads to problems beyond the symptoms of the disease itself. For example, a common concern of people with diabetes is dry skin. So here on behalf of our trusted sponsorship partner, Eucerin, is dermatologist Dr. Elizabeth Tanzi to explain the connection between dry skin and diabetes. I love having you on. Thank you for having me. So help us appreciate what it is about too much sugar in your blood that might lead to dry skin. Well, Dr. Oz, diabetes doesn't directly dehydrate the skin, but excessively dry skin, particularly on the lower legs and feet, is a long-term consequence of having high blood sugar. It turns out that diabetes damages the very small blood vessels throughout the body, and when it damages those small blood vessels in the skin, it reduces the, the supply of vital nutrients and hydration to the skin, and that's what leads to the dry skin. So for the many people out there who have high blood sugars, what's the best way to help with their dry skin? Well, just like any other dry skin condition, the best way to treat dry skin associated with diabetes is a really good long-lasting moisturizer. Um, I particularly like the Eucerin Diabetic Dry Skin Relief because although it doesn't cure the damage to the blood vessels that's been done by the high blood sugar, it has several key ingredients that makes it a really good moisturizer. Number one, it has an alpha hydroxy formulation, which helps to soften the dead skin layer and lift and exfoliate the dry skin on the surface. Yeah. But then it also has another key ingredient called a humectin, and that literally draws water in and locks it on the skin. So it's the combination of the two that really makes it very effective. So I was curious, having heard about some of this new information, how effective it was. So I asked Donna in our audience, who has diabetes and is all too familiar with rough and dry and itchy skin that's often associated with it, if she would try it. So she's been using the Eucerin Diabetic Dry Skin Relief Cream for the past five days. I'm going to show you a close-up of what her leg looked like before. This is a very, very textbook image of what a leg might look like if a person has diabetes. Other things can do it too, but that's sort of dry skin that so many of us complain about. And here's what it looked like after just 24 hours of using the product. I think it's a pretty cool improvement. But I wanted to see how she's doing in person. So she's here in our audience. Let's see how it looks today. Donna, welcome. 
Before you show this, I'll, I'll get to your legs. She wants to show her legs. I love this. I come back over and show you halfway up. I like the way you're doing it too. It's very sensual, slow lift. That's good. You've been practicing at home? Of course. Before I get to how your leg looks now, I, I would love to hear, as someone who has diabetes yes. and doing her best to treat it, what's it like to have to manage the dry skin with it? Well, um, I've been diabetic for almost 20 years and um, my dry skin has been a large problem doing it. And I just couldn't seem to get a hold, a handle on it. So the things you were doing weren't making much of a difference? No, All right. no. All right, let me drum roll, please. I want, I want to see what it looks like now, but I want you to describe in words as you're doing it. So what was it like before and what's it like now? Well, before my skin was peeling, it was um, peeling very dry as you saw in the picture, but the first time Whoa. I used the lotion, it made a tremendous difference. You it's have a beautiful lot softer. legs. Thank you. They're supple and soft, as you mentioned. Thank you. <laughs> Isn't that cool? That's after five days? Yes. Yes. I keep using it, I think. Yes, I definitely will. All right. Thanks to you, Seren, beginning tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. The first 1,000 people to go to DrOz.com will receive a coupon for a free tube of Eucerin Diabetics Dry Skin Relief Cream. And audience, guess what? You're all going home with it, too. <laughs> Enjoy it. We'll be right back. Dr. Oz and Sanjay Gupta clear up confusion on the health headlines you're worried about. The latest superbug killing people in California, the measles outbreak, new dietary guidelines, and more. Plus, your heart is racing, you're sweating, you can't breathe. Is it a heart attack or an anxiety attack? How to spot the difference the moment you start having chest pains. Life-saving clues every woman should know. All new Oz. That's coming up tomorrow. Exercises, falling off the treadmill may be one of the biggest fears out there. Well, that fear became a reality for this man who looks like he was a little distracted. Watch how he handled it. Here he is exercising. Oh my goodness. Oh, 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 oh that's elegant. That's nice. Here, watch it again. He's distracted by that lady. There he goes off the treadmill. But look, right. No form, drops the water and he's back on. No one knows what, right? Listen, just goes to show how you fall doesn't matter. Getting up is what counts, or in this case, doing push-ups, I'm very proud of him. Now it's time for In Case You Missed It. First up, we talked a little about the number one holistic healer for your pain. It's the bromelain found inside this pineapple. Eating pineapple can help alleviate joint pain. You can also take bromelain supplements to help bruises heal faster. Finally, please be careful of dubious people online that make it seem like I'm endorsing their products, because I don't. To see a full list of our trusted sponsors and partners, you can go to DrOz.com, and I'll see you next time.